Aloha, my dear siblings in Christ. Today we're going to continue our study of the letter of James. Now you'll remember two weeks ago, we didn't jump right into the letter, but I explained to you my understanding of how we as contemporary Christians, as non-literalists, approach the scripture trying to understand what it meant perhaps for the writer and for the first hearers, what it's meant for the church through the centuries, and then what it might mean for us now. I also read the entire letter to you. And then last week, we just looked at the first verse of the first chapter, and I, we talked, I hope you heard, about James the possibility that it was James, the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was the author, or at least the influence of its production. The focus of it for that early Christian community who were Christ followers, not yet what we would know quite as Christians, very early on, connected to the church in Jerusalem and Palestine and in the area thereabout that they were Christians who were very aware of the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, the Septuagint, and that the very language of the letter of James was very good Greek, but not extraordinary. It wasn't great literary Greek, <clears throat> but it was liter it was it matched the language of the Bible that the people knew. I also mentioned that Jesus was not yet referred to as the Son of God, but as our Lord. So an early community of Christ followers who still identified with a Jewish faith, but in the Greek language. I then ask you to read the letter of James out loud. I ask one, two, I said it maybe even three times. But I wanted you to get the words into your being so that it became part of you. Reminding you that for most of the life of the church, scripture was not read, it was heard. Just as we do on Sunday morning, someone reads the scripture. For most Christians through the centuries, scripture was something you heard. Not necessarily something you yourself read privately to yourself. But first, let us begin with prayer. Grant, O God, that following the example of your servant, James the Just, brother of our Lord, your church may give itself continually to prayer and to the reconciliation of all who are at variance or enmity. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, learn, mark, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Now hear the letter itself. The letter of James, chapter 1, verse 2 through 12. My brothers and sisters, think of the various tests you encounter as occasions for joy. After all, you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance. Let this endurance complete its work so that you may be fully mature, complete, and lacking in nothing. But anyone who needs wisdom should ask God whose very nature is to give to everyone without a second thought, without keeping score. 
Wisdom will certainly be given to those who ask. Whoever asks shouldn't hesitate. They should ask in faith without doubting. Whoever doubts is like the surf of the sea tossed and turned by the wind. People like that should never imagine that they will receive anything from the Lord. They are double-minded, unstable in all their ways. Brothers and sisters who are poor should find satisfaction in their high status. Those who are wealthy should find satisfaction in their low status because they will die off like wild flowers. The sun rises with its scorching heat and dries up the grass so that its flowers fall and its beauty is lost. Just like that, in the midst of their daily lives, the wealthy will waste away. Those who stand firm during testing are blessed. They are tried and true. They will receive the life God has promised to those who love them as their reward. Now, as we begin our study, I'm sure you notice some interesting things. But, but first, let's remember that there are many parallels in this letter to the Gospels. Now, we know the Gospels weren't written yet. Maybe it's a memory of Jesus' preaching. Maybe it's a gathering of sayings from varying places. Maybe those sayings were used in, in the catechetical process, the teaching process, to teach new believers what Jesus taught. Now you'll find as we go through the Gospel, many of the parallels are with the Gospel of Matthew, which makes sense since Matthew is the most, if you will, Jewish, the closest to the Jewish tradition of the four Gospels. Now there seems to be no parallel to John at all. But to the other Gospels, they're called the Synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, most of the parallels are to Matthew. A couple are to Luke, some to John, I mean to Mark, none to John. And right away, we begin with a parallel from Matthew, from the Sermon on the Mount in uh, chapter 5 of Matthew. Happy are you when people insult you and harass you and speak all kinds of bad and false things about you because of me. Remember, it's Jesus speaking. Be full of joy, be glad, because you have your reward in heaven. In the same way, people harass the prophets who came before you. And James says, think of the various tests you encounter as occasions for joy. Now it's likely that what we're encountering here is what we might call eschatological anticipated joy. I mean that this early Christian community, early Christians believed that judgment was coming, that Jesus was the herald, the Messiah, who was bringing about the kingdom of God. And so the testing was all in preparation for the great joy. Remember in this early Christian community and these Christ followers, by saying that Jesus was Messiah, you were facing social, familial, economic, and even physical persecution. Now perhaps in Rome, in the time of Nero, there was some persecution uh, that impacted that early Christian community in a particular way. But in most places, it was local and sporadic. It would be the local folk being upset with their relatives and friends who were claiming that Jesus was the Messiah. Remember in the Gospel? I have come to set mother against daughter, father against son, familial breakdown, economic hardship, 
social separation. Now, now, that describes a community that recognizes hardship. And, and then it goes on, though. Your testing of your faith produces endurance. Now, now, first you have to ask, what is faith? I think for James and for this early gathering, faith is trust in God. It's theocentric, it's God-centric. It's not so much Jesus as the Christ, it's about getting to God. Trust in God is shown by the way you live. Faith face persecution with joy, and live right. Uh, so, he says, now, let this endurance complete its work in you, so that you may be mature, complete, and lack in nothing. Mature, you understand. That word complete is sometimes translated as, the Greek word is sometimes translated as perfect which you'll remember in Matthew 5 again, we're going right back to the Sermon on Mount, be perfect. Just as your heavenly Father is complete in showing love to everyone, so also must you be complete. Or in some translation, just as your heavenly Father is perfect in showing love, you must be perfect. Ah, so endurance is presented as a teaching, a lesson. It's a virtue. True fortitude, patience, humility. Maturity in God is how you re reach completeness, wholeness for these first believers. Now, We've had a major jump. So we have a, we have a sense that faith comes before good action. And you'll notice later, good action is very important, but it is grounded in faith, trust in God. But then he throws in a new word here. Anyone who needs wisdom should ask God. Wisdom will certainly be given to those who ask. Now, you remember, this is very much like Matthew 7, 7, where Jesus said, ask and you will receive, search and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. But, but it's wisdom that's being asked for. Now, you have to understand that in that early church, particularly those with ties to the Greek-speaking Jewish community, Wisdom was a major part of the teaching of the rabbis. It's even called in, the, in, in, in scholarship the wisdom tradition, and they're wisdom books. You'll remember Proverbs, those little short uh, 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 antidotes and comments about how to live your life. Even Jude was a short story who explained wisdom. But in the period between when the scripture was written in Hebrew, now remember in the, church, in the early days, the Bible meant the first five books of what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew scripture, the Torah. Then there were other writings. There was the poetry, the Psalms. There were prophets. And they were in scrolls. Don't think of them as bound in one book. But in, that, in, in the period between the time that the writing stopped exclusively in Hebrew and the rise of the, of the Christ followers, the new Christian community, there were Jewish authors who wrote in Greek. Now, for the Eastern Orthodox Christians and for Roman Catholic Christians and for Anglican Christians, those books remained in the Bible as we know it. And for most of the early church, the medieval church, they were there. It wasn't until the Reformation and Martin Luther who checked out the rabbis, and the rabbis had gotten rid of the Greek Jewish writings because they were used by the Christians and only used the Hebrew writings and what, they, what became for them the scripture, 
Luther decided that those weren't part of the rabbi's Bible, so they shouldn't be in the Christian Bible. So for most of Protestantism, they were lost. But one of the authors from around 175 BC, one of the authors in the wisdom of Ben, it was, it's called the wisdom of Ben Sirach, or sometimes it's called Ecclesiasticus in, in your Bibles. Sometimes it's just called Sirach. But it's the reflections of a rabbi named the wisdom of Joshua, Jesus, Ben Sirach. And in it, he, exalt, he, he exalts wisdom in a personification of a woman. He's not saying wisdom is a woman, but he, in his writings, he personifies wisdom as a woman, which will then influence even how the church understands the Holy Spirit. But it says, wisdom will exalt her children and take hold of those who seek her. Wisdom it, it, is the way you understand how to live your life in faith. If they persevere in faith, they will inherit her wisdom and their descendants will possess her. Ah, so if you're a person of faith, if you trust in God, wisdom is how you now can understand how to live life so that you will behave as if you are a person of faith. Wisdom is the knowledge of faith that can be put into practice. So the author of the letter of James understands his context. He's talking to a community that knows what faith is and knows what wisdom is because they've read it in their scripture, in the Hebrew scripture, in Greek, because that is their scripture. That is the scripture of the early church. There is there are letters are just being written like James and like Paul in other places and later Peter, what we call first and second Peter. And the gospels haven't been written down. When they say the scripture, it is the Bible of the Hebrew tradition, not even yet bound in a single volume. But if you spoke Greek, a Greek speaking Pharaoh already translated it for you. So it says, whoever asks shouldn't hesitate. They should ask in faith without doubting. Again, in Matthew 21, 21, Jesus says, I assure you that if you have faith and don't doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree. Remember, it's the story of the fig tree. You can even say to this mountain, be lifted up and be thrown into the lake. So you're talking about an understanding of faith that is real and active and alive, but you need wisdom in order to act upon the faith. Faith stands opposed to doubt. Uh, James says, don't be double-minded. Now, then he makes a shift. He's talked about faith and wisdom, but then he says, brothers and sisters who are poor should be sat find satisfaction in their high status. Ah, uh, this is very much like the study we did in 1 Peter. It's the great role reversal that's part of the early Christian church. Remember those early Christ followers? They're poor people. They're the rejected. They're slaves. They're women. They're given status by their relationship to God through Jesus Christ. In other words, we talked earlier about the great expectation. The end is coming. Things will be made right. Now, it's interesting. He then goes, those who are wealthy should find satisfaction in their low status because they will die off like wildfire, wildflowers. Now, they will face nothing but, I mean, this means they'll face nothing but death. 
Now, is he writing here to wealthy Christ followers that they're to be humble? Oh, well, we're going to get a bit of that. Or is he assuming that most of the folk that are gathered as the Christ followers are not wealthy? Uh, later in the letter, we'll, we'll try to see how it balances out. Now, the warning, though, also is common in Ecclesiasticus and in other wisdom literature. That is, if you're wealthy, don't count on it providing for anything. It's even in the Gospel when Jesus said, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. In Ecclesiastes, whoever is honored in poverty, how much more will he be honored if he has wealth? And But he goes on to it's about faith. Wisdom of the humble purses, person raises up their heads and it will be seat them among the wealthy and the officials. Faith changes your status. Your relationship to God in this changes your status. So if you're one of the unimportant, if you're one of the poor, the rejected, if you're a slave, if you're a woman, you have status. You are somebody. We will see the longer farther we get into to James. This has often been considered a very radical letter. Whether it be in the Middle Ages, whether it be in the early church, First, those who withdrew and became hermits. In the Middle Ages, those who tried to bring justice and, among the, and, and those orders that tried to serve the poor. Into our own day, when James has been very much used by liberation theologians in Central and South America. But it does recognize, as you will see, how we live shows the world the faith within us. And we know how to live by the faith that we have from the wisdom given from God. Ah, it's just as important now as it was when the first hearers heard these words. So he concludes here with verse 12, those who stand firm during testing are blessed. They are tried and true. They will receive life. God has promised to those who love him as their reward. Again, it's very much like Matthew 10. Everyone will hate you on account of my name, but whoever stands firm until the end will be saved. I think there is to some degree that this is a very radical letter. It's about living our faith in a broken world with joy, but also calling us to examine how we live. So we're going to continue digging into this letter. Hang on, because we will learn that faith without works is dead. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. We humbly pray you so to guide and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that in all the cares and occupations of our life, we may not forget you, but may remember that we are ever walking in your sight through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks be to you, my Lord Jesus Christ, for all of the benefits you have given us, for all the pains and insults you have borne for us. O most merciful Redeemer, friend, and brother, may we know you more clearly love you more dearly, and follow you more nearly, day by day. Amen. Please, my dear siblings, know that God loves you. Please know that I love you. 
Also know that I pray for you. Please pray for me. Aloha.